Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Daisy Pitkin in support of On the Line and in conversation with Francisco Cantu this evening. Just a quick webinar overview for you as you're joining us. The chat is closed this evening, but we encourage you to keep the chat window open as I'll be sharing links to purchase books from Literati Bookstore throughout the event. The Q&A is available to you, however, please feel free to submit questions at any time using the Q&A, and I will ask a selection of those questions on your behalf at the conclusion of the conversation this evening. Live transcription is also available to you on your toolbar, should you need that. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You can also subscribe to our channel to be kept up to date with all of our at home with Literati events once they become available there. And a special thank you this evening to Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C., our co-presenter this evening and partner for this event. Uh, we're thrilled to partner with uh, one of our, our, our bookstore luminaries in the country, truly, and personally, uh, a store whose event profile I look up to and aspire to. So thank you to our friends at Politics and Prose. And if you're joining us uh, and our customer of Politics and Prose, thank you for joining us. Uh, Check us out whenever you're in Ann Arbor. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan uh, or the Ann Arbor area, of course, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, however, we'd just like to thank you this evening uh, or this afternoon or this morning, uh, depending on when and where you're joining us for tuning in. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Daisy Pitkin has spent more than 20 years as a community and union organizer, working first in support of garment workers around the world, and then for US labor unions organizing industrial laundry workers. Her essays have been awarded the Montana Prize, the Disquiet Literary Prize, the New Millennium Award, and the Monique Whiting Writer's Scholarship. She grew up in rural Ohio and received an MFA from the University of Arizona. Pickin lives and writes in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where she works as an organizer with an offshoot of the Union Unite. Joining her in conversation, Francisco Cantu is a writer, translator, and the author of The Line Becomes a River, winner of the 2018 Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in nonfiction. A former Fulbright Fellow, he has been the recipient of a Pushcart Prize, a wedding award, and an Art for Justice Fellowship. His writing and translations have been featured in The New Yorker, Best American Essays, Harper's, and Guernica, as well as on This American Life. A lifelong resident of the Southwest, he now lives in Tucson, where he coordinates the field studies and writing program at the University of Arizona. Please join me in welcoming Daisy Pitkin and Francisco Cantu into your living rooms. Hi, everyone. I had to find the unmute button. <laughs> um, John, thanks so much for that uh, introduction. And Daisy, it's uh, such a pleasure to be with you in this virtual space. Um, I wanted to say a couple words about um, my relationship with Daisy. Daisy and I, uh, we go way back and our friendship is um, kind of like extends you know, way beyond um, the, the writing world. Um, so Daisy uh, and I both graduated from the same MFA program, which is a little nugget that was buried in those bios. Um, but uh, Daisy graduated from that program before me um, and uh, actually sort of like helped me at a very important time in my life, uh, helped encourage me to apply to, uh, to an MFA program and sort of like help fomented my interest in nonfiction um, and, you know, just like made me feel that uh, writing uh, was something that was that was possible as a as a career. Um, and so, uh, you know, by the weird fluctuations of how books work, like my book came out before hers. Um, but in many ways, I think like Daisy, you are the the senior writer and the person who like really helped me, um, you know, uh, get get my writing into the world. Um, and so I just want to to thank you for that and say it's such an honor to uh, be able to be in conversation about your book. Um, you know, your your book is so 
I, I think I remember hearing you read an essay version, like, um, you know, from an essay that uh, was related to this book more than a decade ago. So it's been just amazing to hear about your journey and to see uh, you put it in between the pages of this book. I think your book is so beautiful. It's so lyric. It's political. It's intimate. Um, it's profoundly humanizing. It's informative. And it's just so deeply felt. And um, I want to just take a minute to congratulate you on this book. And so everybody who's in the room can do a little clap that you won't be able to hear, but you can know that everyone's clapping. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's, I mean, this book, you know, it, it takes the support of a lot of people to, I think, usher a book into the world. And I have appreciated your support on this project for a long time since those kind of early wild iterations in essay form <laughs> over a decade ago. So thanks. Thanks for those kind words. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, obviously, uh, I want I want to ask you about um, a lot about uh, what's what's happening in this book. But I thought first, as an opening question, could you maybe take us back to the person that you were, you know, even um, before you started doing this, uh, you know, before you started doing um, labor organizing, I'm wondering what led you down that path in the first place and um, what made you, you know, want to be, uh, what made you want to work in, in unions and, and organize people? You know, I, I grew up in rural Ohio and um, there were unions were sort of strong in that part of the country. Um, they still are to some extent, but there was a cannery that was a tomato cannery down the road from the farm where I, me and my brothers grew up. And they went through a union organizing drive when I was younger. And there was the Ford stamping plant not too far away where a UAW local was really strong and struck sometimes. So like unions were sort of around in the atmosphere where I was growing up. Um, and when I was an undergraduate in the Twin Cities, I started working with some student labor action groups. So student labor action coalition, um, a little bit with USAS and mainly focused on, you know, um, trying to understand more about where college apparel is made and under what conditions. And as students, I think we realized that we had a position of power. We were the ones who were going to buy or not college apparel. And so we could pressure universities and colleges all across the country. And there was a national movement about that in the late 90s to, you know, to commit to monitoring the factories where college apparel was made. And I was really committed to that kind of anti-sweatshop, anti-corporate globalization movement in the late 90s. But in my senior year of college, some workers organized a Holiday Inn Express in Minneapolis, and seven of the housekeepers got arrested by the INS. They called the INS um, to try to deport them, to break the union. And the rest of the workers at the hotel went on strike, and the community in the Twin Cities rose up almost spontaneously. It was incredible. Um, there were, you know, strike lines, marches, rallies, and I almost dropped out of school that last semester because I got so involved with this campaign. Um, and it really, it changed me to see the power that the workers and their communities had when they worked together, the kind of solidarity that rose up um, out of that community was inspiring to me. And I knew that I wanted to, to work with a union, to work on a campaign that um, could create that kind of feeling, I guess. Well, that's a good transition to um, my next question, because I want to ask you about the campaign that's sort of at the center of this book. Um, and, I, you know, I'm assuming that um, a lot of people who are listening in haven't um, been able to read the book yet. Um, so your book centers on one campaign to unionize an industrial laundry in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but I think what, you know, one of the things that makes your book so remarkable is that it centers even more on an individual relationship that you formed during that campaign. 
um, with a woman named Alma. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about Alma and about sort of the, the dynamics of, of how you met her in this uh, organizing campaign and just talk a little bit about that relationship. So Alma, um, I have so much to say about her. I mean, I wrote a, a whole book really about her, the person she is, the campaign that she led. Um, she's one of the gutsiest worker leaders I've ever met in my life um, in 20 years of organizing work. Um, she's just kind of naturally charismatic and there's something about her that the moment she decided that she was gonna organize in her factory, her industrial laundry factory, nothing anyone could do would get her to stop. I mean, she was, you know, committed and the company fought very hard um, and retaliated against her, intimidated her. And every step of the way, she was just the kind of person who wanted to fight harder. You know, she was not going to be scared or intimidated. And I met Alma really in my first week as a young union organizer because her, we were in the phase of the campaign where we were building a secret committee of workers before the campaign kind of went public. Um, we had to do things very carefully. We often do on an organizing campaign carefully and sort of secretly ahead of what will surely be a, a, a kind of vicious anti-union campaign at some point. And Alma was the first person on the committee at her factory. And we've talked with her first because her husband was cousins with the shop steward of another union laundry um, in California. And so we talked with her. Um, and, you know, from the first moment that I was in her house, sitting on her couch, talking to her about her work, what she did in this industrial laundry every day, she said at the end of that house visit, I know what it means to fight. Um, and kind of sent chills down my spine. It still sort of does. Um, and, and I knew that I had met someone really incredible. Um, she's incredible. And it's, um, I mean, she's like the, the backbone of this book in, in so many ways. Um, and, you know, something else that, that impresses me about your book, Daisy, is the amount of history that you weave um, in and out of, of the personal narrative and of this relationship with Alma and of, you know, sort of the, the ups and downs of this campaign. Um, and, you know, the history that you incorporate especially focuses on um, women's involvement in the labor movement and especially immigrant women. Um, you really vividly reconstruct the, the triangle shirtwaist factory fire which is, you know, one of those like nuggets I remember learning about in high school. Um, and you talk about it so vividly and you zero in on, on the story of uh, women like Clara Lemlich who were uh, involved, you know, deeply involved in that. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you decided which pieces of history to weave into this book. Um, and sort of how you thought about, you know, if it's possible to kind of uh, re-inhabit that time in your life, you know, were you thinking about that history at that time in your life, um, you know, to the degree that the book suggests? And, and if so, you know, how did you see yourself um, and Alma kind of in this lineage? Yeah, and union organizing is really, a lot of it is about storytelling. And we're trained, and at least I was in Unite as a new organizer, trained to tell certain stories that were important in the history of the union that I worked for. So Unite was an offshoot of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which is kind of a, a famous or infamous union. And Unite was very proud of that lineage. It became a part of Unite's kind of identity and mythos. It's idea of itself. And so organizers were trained to tell some of the stories from the founding days of the ILGWU. 
And two of the most important ones were the uprising of the 20,000, which I talk about in the book a lot, um, and the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. And I found that, you know, as a new organizer, I was trained to tell those stories in a certain way. And so I told them in that way. And I didn't just tell them once or twice. I mean, we tell these stories at the first organizing meeting of just about every campaign all across the country. In fact, I'm an organizer now for an offshoot of Unite, which is an offshoot of the ILGWU. And just a couple of weeks ago, some workers were having their first organizing committee meeting here in Pittsburgh, where I live now. And I stood in front of them and told the story of the uprising of the 20,000 and the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. The telling of the stories becomes like ritualistic almost. Um, and it, um, it shapes the union in some ways that I try to try my best to think hard about in the book, um, what kind of shape it gives to the union to tell the stories in the way that we told them. So, I, you know, in the book, I, I talk about the way that I was taught to tell it. And then, you know, I didn't really look beyond that, the way that I had learned to tell the story during my time with the union. Um, with Unite. And mostly that's because organizing work is crazy and overwhelming and very hard and around the clock nonstop and frenetic. And you don't have a lot of time to think about much of anything. But in the years after I left the union, I started looking into those stories and realizing there was a lot more to them. And so in the book, I'd try to untangle the version of the story that I was taught to tell from the real history about what happened. Um, and I find a lot of interesting differences and um, ones that kind of, the differences kind of echo thematically forward in the book in time um, and trouble some of the, the narrative about the organizing that we were doing in Phoenix. Um, actually wanted to ask you about um, you, you, you write uh, kind of what you've just described as a scene early on in the book um, where you are telling the story of um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Um, and uh, you become very emotional in the telling and one of your trainers tells you, people don't learn to organize through emotional outbursts. And kind of like reprimands you afterwards. Um, and so, you know, you, you talk about the way that you were taught that, uh, quote, organizing is a system, rational and teachable. And I was wondering, um, there's, there's a, a paragraph that follows this scene on um, page 21 um, that I was wondering if you would read to us, just because I think it's, um, yeah, I want to hear you read it and then maybe talk uh, more about it and, and where you are with it now. Mm. So um, I was thinking that the paragraph, I believed in this system. Oh yeah, okay. But you can read uh, before or after that, whatever you like. Okay. Um, yeah, I believed in this system. I believe in it and teach it still today, but I'm not sure the trick of moving people without being moved, of telling stories meant to evoke emotion that I, the teller, was not meant to feel, helped to make the union, or me, or anyone, any stronger. After all, unions are built on solidarity, and solidarity is a form of closeness, maybe even intimacy, a network of deep connection that rewires a splintered collective. By definition, it is unity or agreement of feeling or action, feeling or action. What would it mean to build a union on both? I, I think, Daisy, that tension um, seems to, it's, it's so present throughout the book, um, that tension between, you know, emotion and this more kind of like methodical approach um, to organizing work. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk about that um, a little bit more and, and um, where you are with that tension now, because this is still your work. Yeah. 
Um, my relationship with that tension fluctuates all the time now, still. Um, it surprises me in my kind of return to the labor movement that my own kind of relationship with these questions is still pretty fraught. Um, but I think, you know, the union culture that I came up in at Unite was really based on this kind of stoic rage. There was like a feeling that underlay all of the organizing that we did, which was really about this closely controlled kind of righteous indignation or anger. Um, and I think that emotion was really powerful um, and it, it was important in a lot of ways. And I was taught as an organizer, and I, I still believe today that one of the only emotions strong enough to get people through their fear of forming unions, which is, you know, a fear of standing up for yourself against um, an authoritarian force and power, right? There's fear inherent in that. And one of the only emotions strong enough to get people through their fear is anger. Um, and I think that's true, but I think also that um, there are a lot of other emotions involved with organizing. If we focus our organizing really only on anger and our anger at the thing that is the oppressive force, um, then, then really the, the whole campaign, the whole movement of resistance is focused on dismantling something else instead of building something new. And I feel like we, you know, if we try to constrain our organizing lives and the, the worlds that get built inside the movement of resistance that we are kind of constructing hour by hour, day by day, lap by lap in the car around the city when we're doing house calls. Um, you know, if that's built only on the singularity of anger, we're really missing out on building something that I think is much stronger and more vibrant and possibly more important. Um, so the question, the paragraph before that you read, um, or that the trainer, the sentence that you read, the trainer telling me that, um, you know, organizing doesn't happen through emotional outbursts. I think on reflection, I think what is organizing if it's not an emotional outburst? <laughs> I think organizing is an emotional outburst. Um, and I think beyond anger, there's like care and love and mutual aid. And if we're not finding ways to forge those other emotions and actually fold them into the organizing work that we're doing um, or harness them and let them be the primary emotion that fuels a fight, then, then what, are we, what are we building? What are we doing? Um, so the book is really kind of thinking, thinking about that and thinking also then about like the relationship that a paid staff organizer who by definition has nothing at stake in an organizing campaign, right? I'm not gonna lose my job um, for organizing a union. My job is to organize the union. I'm paid to do this. Um, I, I'm taking on no risk. Um, what is my role in kind of the emotional life of the union that's being built? Um, I think that's not something that go that gets interrogated very often in the work that that I do and I think it ought to be I think it should be because if we don't interrogate it then it becomes a kind of center of power inside the organization that is unseen or unquestioned and that makes me uncomfortable this is why I love your book so much all of the thinking that you just laid out is, um, you know just in all the conversations that we hear about the labor movement, I feel like, um, you know, at least as as a person who's not involved in it from the outside, you know, we rarely hear about these about these kind of questions um, at this deep of a level. So I'm so glad that you're out here, um, kind of like giving us language to to think about and talk about that element of of organizing. Um, I want to switch gears a, a little bit and ask you about um, some of the craft decisions um, that you made in writing this book. Um, it's it's such a, a lyric book. And I think um, 
knowing you the way that I do, that, that makes so much sense to me. And, uh, and, uh, I think that it's most evident perhaps with, um, this recurrent symbol that we encounter throughout the book of these moths. And, um, it's, it's, it's also a symbol for your relationship with Alma. You call each other Las, Poli Las Polias, um, the moths. And, um, but you know, you, you spend a, a lot of time thinking about moths as a symbol. Um, you, we, we, we find out a lot of the sort of biology and science um, behind moths. And I know that you at different points and different moments in, in the life of this book had to really fight to keep the, the moths as such a sort of integral symbol to this book, um, kind of, you know, the book's abiding metaphor. And I'm wondering if you can, can talk about that and, um, you know, the, the, the choice to uh, keep that lyricism in the book and to sort of, you know, really uh, spend time sort of inhabiting and unpacking and exploring um, this symbol, this metaphor. Yeah. There are a lot of moths in the book, right? <laughs> I think um, the moths are, they are there because, um, you know, they were real in the beginning that um, at the start of the organizing at Alma's factory, there was a kind of infestation of moths in Phoenix. Um, it was, had been a really warm kind of wet winter and there was just this massive kind of Im immersion um, of moths. And a lot of the organizing at Alma's factory happened overnight um, because it was a 24 hour operation, seven days a week. So we would hold shift meetings in the middle of the night in the parking lot in front of her factory. And there were floodlights, you know, and we would stand under the floodlights. And if there's an infestation of moths and you're standing under a floodlight, of course, you're surrounded by moths and you, we could hear them like plinking their bodies against the light above. And it became this kind of ambient sound and feeling to the campaign that is hard to describe, except that it was there, they were everywhere. And Alma and I started calling ourselves Las Bolillas, as you say, because it, it was sort of a joke at first, but I had been reading In the Time of the Butterflies by Julia Alvarez, um, in, you know, in which she writes about the Mirabal sisters in the Dominican Republic who worked clandestinely to oppose the Trujillo dictatorship. Um, and they called themselves Las Mariposas, the butterflies. And we joked that we were kind of their ugly cousins doing our like resistance work in the dust of South Phoenix, like driving around in circles madly. Um, so it started out as a joke, but then when I left the union, um, you know, I was really burned out in 2009 when I walked away from organizing for a while. And I was sick, really um, physically unwell. And I was heartbroken because there was a lot of internal strife in the union that I had to walk away from. Um, and Alma and I were not in contact with each other at all. And I thought, you know, I'm done with all of that. I can't, I'm too kind of heartbroken and burned out and I'm not gonna think about unions or labor organizing ever again, I'm done. And I started wake, making all these like weird art projects about moths, <laughs> like thinking that I was not thinking about Alma and the organizing that we had done, like pretending for some reason that I was like looking away from it when in fact I was using the moths to look directly at it or to, to sort of think through some things, I think. And I think the moths in the book do the same kind of thing. They allow space to think about the questions in the book is in another kind of way. Um, and, you know, as you say, through my kind of weird obsession with moths, I find all kinds of crazy connections with early labor resistance, both in this country and um, in Europe, um, you know, 
moths were sort of a harbinger of industrial trouble and the peppered moth and its adaptation. Um, so that the exploration of moths just becomes another angle through which to look at the same questions and problems that I'm kind of troubling or toying with or working through in the book. Um, I'm glad that they read as kind of lyrical passages because I think I think that organizing work is beautiful and it's emotional and that it's not, it is sometimes written about that way, but not often. And as a reader, I really craved a story that about organizing or about the labor movement that felt like organizing to me. Um, and I feel like the moths create, create a layer in the book where that kind of feeling can exist. I think it definitely, it definitely worked for me. Um, uh, Daisy, you mentioned, you know, kind of this uh, feeling of, of, of being burnt out. And, you know, we, you, you allude to it in the book. Um, you talk a little bit about the, the period of sort of like leaving the union. Um, and, you know, as, as we really uh, get into the, the meat of this book and as we sort of like um, start to work our way towards the, towards the end, um, we really begin to see and understand like just how messy this work is of, of organizing. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's infighting and drama, and I guess that shouldn't be surprising. This is the same in, in kind of any workplace, but I think the stakes feel very different. Um, and, you know, you even, uh, you have an epigraph at the beginning of the book that quotes from um, Jane McAlevey that, uh, you know, quote, unions are such a pain in the ass. Um, and, and I wonder, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of part of, um, again, for, for me as somebody who's, you know, coming at this from the outside, it was really part of my takeaway was, um, seeing the, the messiness of that work. And, and I'm wondering if you could talk about, um, where you are now with respect to, you know, how you think about this the messiness of, of, of organizing? Does it seem like something that could be, uh, you know, avoided, improved upon, bettered? Or, you know, do you see this mess as, as necessary and just, you know, kind of like an inherent part of, of the work and that's okay? Hmm. I mean, I think, I think there is, it's difficult to do the work of building a democratic organization without some mess, right? Like, democracy, especially when it's real, is kind of slow um, and it's hard. Um, I think that th that doesn't speak to the kind of messiness that was happening in the union at that time, right? There was, um, it was sort of the opposite of that. So I think, I think some messiness is going to be inherent in a labor movement that is vibrant and functioning and internally democratic where there's sort of a, the rank and file membership is a living part of the, the organization and has agency. Um, I think there's bound to be some mess in that, right? I think um, something really interesting is happening in the labor movement right now, actually. And, you know, I've only been back um, working in the labor movement again officially for about the last two years. Um, and in my return to the labor movement from, you know, after this long break, I think there's a, there's a lot of talk um, and in some cases, a lot of serious action inside unions around this question of internal democracy. Um, whose union is it? Who gets to make the decisions? Um, and we're seeing right now, uh, a, a wave of internal organizing inside of unions um, to make them more democratic. And that's happening at the same time where there's this incredible kind of groundswell of organizing happening all across the country. 
And I don't think it's a coincidence that both things are happening at the same time. Like workers are um, in sector after sector. I mean, it's not just, it's Starbucks workers, it's um, Amazon workers, it's miners and I mean, Kroger's um, all over, you know, in the Western part of the country and museum workers, higher ed workers, and there's organizing in every kind of sector you can imagine in every region of the country right now. So that's happening at the same time that there's a real loud call inside lots of unions for, a, for more internal democracy. And I think the fact that those two things are kind of happening at the same time is really encouraging. It's really inspiring. But it kind of brings into focus some of the questions in the book about the job of a paid staff union organizer. Um, like, you know, here I'm, I have a lot of experience and some expertise and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Unions are full of experts. You know, we have communications people and researchers and lawyers and um, campaigners and strategic planners. And, um, you know, it's unions are often top heavy with experts. And there's a question right now being asked in real time on these campaigns about what that means. Is that the right structure? Hmm. What does it mean to have campaigns run by a team of experts, what kind of union gets formed at the end of, you know, at the end of that campaign. Um, and, you know, I'm lucky right now to get to work with a small group of organizers on a massive national campaign that are thinking about that question all the time. Like, how do we democratize the expertise that we have so that, you know, all of the experience, um, and language and know-how that I have, how do I democratize that so that workers who are fighting to organize their workplaces and each other's workplaces can do those things themselves? How do I democratize that expertise and then just get out of the way to allow this momentum to, to continue? Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I have, well, I have a lot more questions, but I'm only going to ask you a few more questions. Um, and then, uh, you know, as, as John mentioned at the uh, during the intro, um, we're going to pause to invite audience questions. And so if anybody is formulating questions, uh, please type those into the chat. Um, I see we've already got some questions, but um, yeah, other other folks who haven't chimed in yet. Um, but so I want to ask you maybe two more questions, Daisy, before we do that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, if you would mind reading again now, kind of from the end of the book, I think this passage, um, you know, you've, you, you've talked a lot about this idea of um, interrogating the notion of what kind of, of power is being built by unions, right? Like what kind of power are unions replacing the power that they're attempting to you know um deconstruct or displace with um and so on on page 260 you have two paragraphs that i think just uh get at this notion so beautifully um and so if you would mind reading the from i think now uh, to the follow the end of the following paragraph at the top of 261. I think now that fighting from a place of anger is most effective in the kind of organizing that's satisfied with taking power away from the boss and calling it union. This type of organizing is top down, more interested in cleaving the orange than in creating a new kind of sustenance that arises out of care and hope and solidarity a sustenance that diminishes oppressive power simply by existing, yet is made of a different substance. I've come to think of solidarity, this mixture of hope and care, as a physical force, or maybe a force field. And, so, and as such, it invisibly acts on all things that are passing through it at all times. It's the space between bodies that are marching or singing or striking or otherwise taking action together. Maybe you felt it at a protest 
or on a picket line. I've heard people say that it feels like church. It's the way bodies, our bodies, working collectively, change the properties of the space between them. It's the most important thing. Um, I love I love those two paragraphs so much, Daisy. Thank you for reading them. And, um, you know, please expound upon them to whatever extent that you want. But I, I feel like the question that I have, especially given your last answer, um, maybe to sort of uh, set us up for our audience questions um, is sort of, you know, with the, the current um, sort of shifting awareness and movement building that uh, is happening right now, which, you know, you sort of des described as, as being really, um, you know, something that's, that's, that's on the rise. Um, you know, I, I, I think back to your story and I think to sort of the arc of this campaign in Phoenix and, you know, there were no real tidy victories. There were, there were sort of, um, temporary victories that were followed by setbacks that were followed by more qualified victories. Um, and so I'm wondering if you, you know, kind of with your eye on the work that you're doing now and to just like the work that we have to do um, as a nation, like how, given your experience, do you think we should think about what constitutes victory or what constitutes progress now? That's a good question. I think, um, you know, I hope that the labor organizing that's happening now will result in like material victory. People need to um, be able to make demands about benefits and wages and health and safety on the job. And I hope that these fights, and I believe that they will, will lead to actual sort of material victories in that way. But also, I think that organizing work. Um, you know, it changes people. So when people sort of take the first step to decide that they're going to stand up with them for themselves or decide that they're going to fight alongside their coworkers to try to change the power dynamic at work, they witness their own capacity to fight and it changes them, right? It's organizing work is transformative in that way. And what I love about what's happening now, you know, a lot of the organizing happening across the country involves young people. And there are some young people who have started calling themselves Generation U, Generation Union. Um, and I think that's really powerful because if we learn to fight, if we watch our capacity for resistance grow um, at a young age, it stays with you your whole life, right? You carry around that kind of agency and the knowledge that you are capable of resisting. So if there's a generation of people who at a very young age right now are witnessing their own capacity for resistance and it's growing their capacity as it does, then that to me is really powerful and it will be a victory that kind of hangs around for a long time. Thank you, Daisy. I'll uh, invite John back in. I could keep asking you questions uh, for another hour, but um, let's let's see what the audience has to ask you. We do, have, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, and again, if you have questions for Daisy, please feel free to submit them um, using the Q&A feature. It's on your toolbar. Uh, first question, um, Jean-Paul asks, how, how has social media changed your relationship to organizing and to writing? I, you know, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about social media. Um, I, I get to work for a union right now that is lucky enough to be supporting Starbucks workers in their organizing. And I really say in their organizing because it's unlike any campaign I've ever worked on before. The workers are organizing themselves and each other. And then they reach out to us for support for like, you know, how do I legally file this petition? <laughs> what is that? Um, but they're doing all of the work. And this the way social media is working on that campaign is 
teaching me a lot about social media. Um, you know, I'm just sort of sitting back watching it, but they're not only organizing across social media, they're sort of broadcasting their organ. They're having a conversation with themselves about the organizing work that they're doing in a very public way. And I think it's powerful, um, you know, to sort of constantly broadcast the way that the movement is being built to the public while it's happening, like in real time, you know, like someone will on Twitter say, you know, we just won our election and we're going into bargaining. And someone else will say, oh, we're going into bargaining too. Let's have a meeting. <laughs> and it's like happening in front of everyone who wants, who cares to watch. Um, and so I think, I think this campaign will teach us a lot about what that means to sort of do this, do this work in a public fashion in a, in a new kind of way. How has social media changed my writing? I don't, probably not in any good way. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm on Twitter and Instagram a lot more than I would like to be. Uh, but I, I do have to say that the, one of the interesting things about having a book kind of in the world is watching the way other people engage with it. Um, and the kind of support of the writerly community has been really amazing and wonderful. Um, and so I'm happy for that aspect of social media for sure. Thank you. Uh, the same viewer uh, has another question. Uh, curious to know if uh, the COVID experience helped or hindered uh, labor movement organization. I think um, I think that the pandemic brought into very sharp focus some of the forces at work in the world that are colluding against working people. Um, and so in some ways it maybe accelerated this, uh, this, you know, groundswell that we're seeing now. Um, you know, I work for Workers United and it's still the union of industrial laundry workers. And so we have some members here in Pittsburgh who work at industrial laundries. And I was visiting one just a couple months ago and the shop steward there was, I met with him in the, in the cafeteria and there's a banner hanging up on the wall that said, you know, you are essential. And he was pointing to it and he said, you know, you know what that banner says to me? That banner says, yeah, there was a global pandemic, but get your butt to work anyway. Um, so I think there is a lot of this, you know, calling people essential and heroes sort of early on in the pandemic. And a lot of corporations even gave, especially union ones, because the union um, was in in place so workers could bargain for hazard pay and got it in a lot of cases, maybe a dollar more an hour or two dollars more an hour. And then that money disappeared after a time. And so workers saw their employers, many of them multi-billion dollar international corporations making record profits during the pandemic. They could see that paying them one or two more dollars an hour didn't bankrupt the company, but the money disappeared anyway. And workers didn't get to continue seeing that piece of those record-breaking profits, right? Um, so I think, I think there are a lot of forces at play right now, but the pandemic certainly accelerated this kind of, um, the kind of backing working people up against the wall. I mean, there's nowhere to go at this point except to organize, except to act collectively on a mass scale. Um, and that's what's happening. And we're gonna see more of it. Thank you. Uh, Andrea writes, how do you navigate writing about vulnerable populations like undocumented migrants in a way that is both truthful, but also mindful of their vulnerabilities? I think, you know, I thought a lot about that during the writing of the book. And I think the way that I tried to deal with it in the book is by writing exactly about that. Like part of the book is about the fact that I'm writing about a, this power dynamic that was inherent in the organizing work that I did. Like most organizers for the union that I worked for were white and college educated, spoke English, um, 
And most of the workers that we were helping to organize were immigrants. Most of them were women. Some of them were undocumented as well. Um, and, you know, so here I am, a paid staff organizer that comes with all of those various privileges and the intersections of them. And I'm asking workers, in fact, my job is to sort of foment a campaign among workers who stand to lose a lot. I mean, people don't work at industrial laundries unless they have to, right? It's not a job that people take unless they have to make money in order to make ends meet. Um, so the book in, in some ways takes that on as a subject and explores it. And that was my way of trying to be as honest and real in a way that's not at all sentimental about those, about those facts. Thank you. Um, we, we're at the, the end of our viewer questions, um, but perhaps, I know Francesco, you had some questions you maybe didn't get to. So I'd like to perhaps give you the opportunity to ask, I think with our, our little bit of time we have left here, maybe perhaps ask the last question for us. Yeah, um, Daisy, I wanted to ask you about Alma. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, you know, you, you mentioned in an earlier um, response that, um, you know, there was a there was a moment where you sort of fell out of touch with Alma. And I'm wondering if you're back in touch with her now. Um, and and if so, you know, ha have you talked with her about this book? Has she read the book? Um, I, I would love to know more about where your relationship with her stands now and how and just like how is she doing and, and what is she doing? Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I had some material from this book in the form of like these frantic letters that I had written to her about a decade ago that I was kind of writing essays about, but um, I didn't really imagine that they would ever be published material. And part of that was because I wasn't in contact with her. Like, what does it mean to write so intimately about someone who you're not in contact with anymore? Um, so I kind of tucked all of that material away. And then a, a few years ago, I saw a picture of Alma on Facebook. <laughs> she was just there and I hadn't seen her in years. Um, and an acquaintance who was an organizer in Arizona had posted a picture of her um, working on a campaign. And I connect, you know, I messaged him and said, you know, can, can I be put back in touch with Alma? I, I, I want to. Um, see if she is willing to talk with me. And he gave me her phone number. And at first she didn't answer. Um, and then about a year later, she wrote to me um, over text message. So we re we kind of reestablished contact. Um, and we talked for about a year. And then I kind of uncovered that early material that I had and talked to her about writing a book. And at first, I, you know, I wanted to write a book just sort of telling the story of the campaign at her, at her factory, because I think we're in a moment right now where people are seeing headlines about organizing campaigns left and right, but it, most people don't know what it takes to form a union. Um, and I thought that the book would be much more sort of a straight lace blow by blow of that campaign, but like, Here's what's wrong with U.S. labor law. Here's why it's so hard for workers to win unions right now, but why it's so vitally important. Um, and she, you know, is proud that this story exists in the world. She's proud that people know about um, what she and her coworkers had to go through. She teases me that there are still so many moths in the book, but that's kind of the way our relationship is. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he hasn't read the book yet because it's not fully translated into Spanish, but the parts that are about um, her and about the organizing campaign, I've translated some of them, but talked to her over the phone about, about them. Some things I couldn't remember. She helped to remind me about kind of thing. It's so awesome to know that uh, she is still involved in organizing and that at, like in so many ways, um, 
it's it's work that you're both still doing side by side, even though you're not on the same campaigns anymore. So that's really yeah, good. yeah. We've reached the the top of the hour on At Home with Literati, uh, I should say At Home with Literati with Politics and Prose Live. Um, Daisy Pickin, Francisco Cantu, thank you so much for joining us this evening um, at At Home with Literati. Um, your, your old friend from Tucson, Hannah, texted me and says hi. Oh, um, yeah, hey, hi, Hannah. <laughs> by the way. Um, but we hope to have you in this store for, for your next books uh, in the not too distant future. But um, until then, we hope you continue to be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great night, everybody. Take care. John. Thanks, John. Thank you so much, Paco, for being here tonight. Thanks for your time, for those wonderful questions. Oh, no, and thanks thank for hosting. You. Have a good night. Bye, all. Good night, everybody.